I had to figure out, all right, in what way are they damaged and how can, how can I exploit that to make an entertaining book? You got to number three on the bestsellers list with the second book? I got to number two in a specific category. So I don't want to blow it up to more than it is. We did. Take it. This is all, exactly. This is all Cindy. Like we were trying to think of some ways to, I've been so much in production mode. I haven't done as much to market as I need to. And I figure once the third is done and we have the package, then it's much more. So um, I wanted to put together some promotional stuff. I looked up some things. I asked her and she made some recommendations and, you know, as far as what to advertise. So we did a, a Twitter promotion uh, for the ebook and it shot up in the sci-fi, particularly for Valentine's Day, sci-fi romance, romance and uh, genetic engineering science fiction, three categories. It went to number two in sci-fi romance and number three in like genetic engineering. Fantastic. And it, in, and it actually broke the top 100 in Kindle for like a day. That's I was, okay. I was, so I'm not, I'm not best selling. I'm too. <laughs> Second I'm best selling is pretty damn good. It's a big old world. So, yes. And Ivan was, of course, the character of John. And John, rightly, I said, I didn't make it. And he's like, I bet you made it to number one on Valentine's Day. And I said, no, I'm pretty sure I didn't. He's like, but you weren't there. You might have. <laughs> what, do you mean? what does he mean you weren't there? Well, I wasn't online. I actually unplugged. So what I this is how ridiculous I got about it. This must be what, what gamblers go through. I got to number two. It was like 11 o'clock at night. I had been up since 5.30 in the morning working, and I was sleep-deprived and exhausted. As you may have known by the email I sent you giving bullet points for this conversation, it's like, wow, I should not be near, allowed near a computer when I'm sleep-deprived. But it got to number two. It was 11 o'clock. I'm like, I need to go to bed. I woke up at 2 a.m. and like just logged on the check, and it was still at 2. And then the next morning, it went to 3 and 4, and I'm like, ah. Missed, missed the curve. <laughs> oh, so it could have gone higher. You just weren't watching at that time. We could we could pretend. <laughs> you could set a Google alert, couldn't you? And then it will alert you. Would that alert? Would that do I that? Don't I don't know for Amazon. I don't think. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. Actually, talking about when the third one comes out, I didn't. I've done a new thing. You probably aware of it. And you're probably planning it anyway. But there's a lady I work with called, she's called W.J. May. She's an author. And I did a series of five romance novels for her a little while ago. And she's, she's asked me to put them together in a bundle. Have you heard of this? Uh, I, I haven't done it. I have seen them. And well, I I've done it. I know how oh. to do it now. <laughs> oh, okay. And I, I put five so I could easily do three. So, so let me know when the third one comes out, when you want to do that. I don't know so whether you, you, you have them individually for a while, because these have been on sale for a little while, maybe six months. And then okay. she's, now, she's now got me to put together a bundle as well. I don't know whether there's a, there's a so you, if okay. you work out the time, because you don't want the bundle sales to affect the actual sales, because obviously when you buy it in a bundle, you're getting the discount, you see. So I don't know whether you wait and that's like a second wave or something. But if you that find out, I know how to do it now. Okay, I will. I didn't know you could do that for audio too. So that would make sense because on on Amazon you have to have the print ready before the audio. Because I was ready to have you do the audio like a month before I sent it to you, but you have to have it published and ready to go before they let you oh. claim it. Oh. Yeah. So you can't just if you wanted to just put out an audio version, you can't do that through the system we're using with with uh, ACX and Amazon and uh, and Audible. Exactly. The closest we could get is I could send you the script and say, here, start recording, but we wouldn't be allowed to upload anything until it was published and claimed, at least the way it is now. Wow. Okay. Oh, and they've gotten really strict. You mentioned your email and, and bullet points to talk about for this conversation, which obviously oh, I've read, yeah, and, and there yeah. are some really interesting things in there. But... I just figured it would save you some time going through like two websites trying to figure out what's she doing now. Well, this is this is our what is this our third or fourth chat? It's certainly our second chat specifically that, that I wanted to do to help promote the audio book. But so this... you did two for me yeah. for to, to promote, and uh, we, we did one with Dr. Roger and friends. Yeah. So this is uh, what? Let me see, three, four. Yeah. So this is the second this together. Is, this is fifth. number four. Yeah. So, oh, wait, I gotta do math. Yeah. Yeah. Which which I, I find the more I the more I chat to people, the easier oh, it gets and the less fine. prep you have to do. Sorry? 
It is five because I interviewed you twice and then there was the Doc Roger and Friends interview and then you interviewed me once before, so this is the fifth one. It is five. Oh, well. Well, we just don't need, we don't need any prep at all. But you, <laughs> but you did mention in your one just how crazy busy you are. What have you got going on right now? As well, yeah. well and obviously, don't worry if anyone is a fan of uh, of the Data Collectors, the sci-fi series, or the audiobook version. We're going to get to that, but I just want to get some more stuff before we do get to that. Let's let's talk about how yeah. crazy busy you are right now. Yeah. Um, so I should preface this by saying that if I had children, which I don't. And if I had to be a caregiver for my parents, which both have passed, so I don't, none of this would have happened. So for the people who are, you know, I, I talk to friends of mine with kids and they're like, wow, it's amazing what you're doing. I'm like, yeah, but I don't have, you know, kids that I have to be responsible for homeschooling and working. Um, that said, I would not recommend the schedule for anyone. I, I kind of started in February, actually pre-pandemic with the idea I wanted to go back to school for some certifications related to coaching. Uh, which we can talk about. So yeah, yeah. I signed up which, for them. Which, which kind of coaching, just to give us an overall? So this is um, positive psychology coaching. So I have a background in, as you know, in uh, spiritual advising, ministry, like non-denominational because I'm not religious. I have a background in meditation. I taught yoga for years. But I wanted to have the psychology side um, for because not everybody comes from that frame of reference. Some people are like, I want the facts, the figures, I want hard science to prove. So I wanted to go back for specifically positive psychology. And I found a, a certification on coaching. And I didn't even think I wanted to be a coach. I just wanted the information. <laughs> so, but I turned out I really, really enjoyed it. So um, I went through that and then subsequently, uh, which we can talk about it if, if you want to nerd out on, on the stuff that I nerd out on, which is uh, emotional intelligence training and, and Myers-Briggs personality typing and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's just the certification. That's not the work. So that that's um, so that so that's what which is still going to take up a lot of time because it's study. You've got to get it. It's got to go in. Well, I, I finished the studies. I need to. The only thing that I am doing for myself is there is a um, credential that you can get because basically anybody can call. I hate the word life coach because it's thrown around so easily, and anybody could be a life coach. You could hang up this call and set up a website, Graham, and say you're a life coach and charge people money and there'd be no, there's no licensing, you could do it. And it also it's vague as, I mean, you know, if I tell someone how to organize their sock drawer, that counts as being a life coach, but it's not really gonna help them that much. And it's, and it's not technically coaching, you're advising, you ah. know? So the idea with coaching um, is it's not, it, it differs from therapy. So in therapy, I'm gonna say, here are the things that are wrong, let's talk about your childhood and why things are the way they are now. Uh, and this is very a general, very general statement. I'm not diagnosing. I'm not qualified. I'm not a therapist. But what a coach will do is assume you know what's best for you. I'm not going to tell you, right? So I'm not in, going to advise you unless you're hiring me as an advisor to say, how do I set up my social media account and blog? I'm not going to advise you. If you say, I want to write a book and, and I'm not getting, you know, I keep getting derailed. I keep getting stressed out. At it, it's overwhelming. I'm the one that will brainstorm with you and help you figure out, okay, what's the next step? What's the next step? How will I know you've done that and hold them accountable? So it assumes, this is very long-winded, I apologize, no, but no, it's cool. they have all the answers and I'm just asking questions and they're talking it out. And as they're talking it out, it's kind of helping them figure out for themselves what they want to do. And is it all a, a bit like meditation? Is it about getting rid of the clutter and just getting in on the focus? Is, is it a very similar discipline? Yeah. It's, it's very similar to, you have to be mindful. In fact, for some of the people that I coach currently, um, we start with with some kind of meditation just to get them in the frame of mind. Because some people are kind of bouncing in so many different directions. And as somebody who juggles three different careers and have done so since I was 16 years old, I get that you have to learn how to compartmentalize, <laughs> you know, and, and focus as you're saying, so yeah. Yeah, and time management for me, for me, time management is is one of the main things for that is to like, is to say, and and to be strict. You know, I you know, um, when I did breakfast radio, my co-host, well, one of the times I did breakfast radio, my co-host at one of the radio stations, I was all, in fact, this particular radio station, I was the program director at the radio station. I had mm -hmm. about sixty people working for me, 
and I was also the breakfast show host, so I was super busy. And my breakfast show co-host, he'd say, like, can we do this on this particular date at this time? And I'd get my diary out and go, no, no, I'm having a sleep then. And he'd go, you put <laughs> sleep in your diary? And I went, yeah. If it's a day where I've got a big meeting at, like, 5 yeah. o'clock in the evening or I've got to go to a council meeting or something in town because it was a local station, so you, yeah. you had to be part of the community as well. If I'm going to that, then I'm going to need... If I've been up since 4 a.m. to do the breakfast show, I'm going to need to sleep at lunchtime that day. And, like, I would be really yeah. strict about whatever I put in my diary. It was yeah. holding... I wouldn't just go, oh, okay. No, I whatever it was. Yeah. So the trick was usually to not tell people what... Just go, if I could say, no, I'm not available then, is to not tell them why yeah. and have them judge. <laughs> just tell, yeah. just say no. Because if you said, no, I'm having a sleep then, people just don't don't get it. But it's yeah. really important. I, fortunately, that's changing, and I'm the same way, and I micromanage it. The, it's the only reason I got things done, micromanaging the hell out of everything, because I've been going like seven days a week. I told you I took Valentine's Day off. Right. Where I turned off the phone, turned off the computer. In fact, I didn't check email or phone calls for like two days, which was really hard for me. I don't um, think I I've did... ever done that. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. I took, yeah, but but uh, that Sunday was the only day I didn't work. And prior to that, it wasn't since September, my birthday. So I've just been going between studying and working. And it's not like, um, I mean, it's like 60, 70 hour a week, which for some people that's normal, but that's not normal for me for a year. <laughs> So, so there's so, the so there's the studying, yeah. There's obviously and, there's the writing. I mean, and we're not we're not talking writing. about a little bit of writing. We're talking about best-selling yeah. novels here. I, I uh, yes, I published two books and uh, am about forty percent of the way through the third, and then I started a new coaching business based on this. So I started the new business and the certifications, and then at work. There was a lot of ups and downs with COVID because a lot of the programming that I was contracted to create is for in-person interaction. So all of a sudden, as I'm starting class, we're, we're having to revamp all this programming to be virtual and virtual in communities with older adults who may or may not know the technology. So there's training involved. So it was it was nutty. Um, and I, the last certification I did, I purposely scheduled it for January because I'm like, come February, that's going to be a year's time. And I know I know there's going to be a crash. Like, And last week, I'm like, here it is. <laughs> you you so, mean a personal crash? Uh, not. Uh, it just, you can't stay in that state. I, and you probably d uh, are aware of this. So, so when you have a rigorous schedule, I usually plan for my crashes. When I say crash, it's like, People go and go and go, and then they have a day off, and they're just completely exhausted, and they just shut everything out. For some people, it's burnout. You never had that where you just were going, and you just became completely exhausted and, yeah. like, burnt out? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then so you just have people... to cancel a load of stuff that you've planned and let people down, and you, yeah, because right. you just so need I a day. Yeah. yeah, so I don't want to cancel on people. I plan for my crashes. Like, I'm like, okay, I know I can do this schedule through this week, but then Saturday, Sunday – you know, I'm unplugging and I'll actually let people know if it's an emergency call John, my phone's not on, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and then, and that's my recovery. So when I say I plan for the crash, I'm like, I knew this is not a pace that I could do for years. Some people do it. If I did this for years, then I'd suddenly develop some really bad chronic illness because I just couldn't, you know, but for the year, I'm glad I did it. Yeah. I, I, spent most of the time my life feeling like I'm always a little behind, like I should be further ahead, I should be further along in my career. And it's like, after this year, I'm like, I think I caught up. <laughs> like, I feel good. <laughs> do, do you think it, Do you think you could also be this, this character type that they say, which is a people pleaser, which means if something comes up, you want, don't want to let someone down, you just say yes? Uh, yeah, I am getting very good at boundaries, for sure. And that's a lot of what comes up when I'm coaching other people, and I'm very strict with those boundaries, uh, as you were mentioning, where you block off your sleep and block off time, there's, there's a non, yeah, so I am definitely not like that. I do want to do, obviously, be competent in work. But yeah, the people pleasing stuff and the boundaries and things have, have, are firmly in place. Right. So this is all, if I'm being honest, self inflicted. <laughs> okay, but so you're not out of control. Certifications, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. Can I pick up a couple of things that you, you mentioned? You're an interfaith oh, no. minister. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you also said that you're not particularly religious. Correct. Now, those 
two don't sound like they would go together. Now, I'm not religious. I've got nothing against people like Jesus. You know, he sounds like he's, you know, he was some kind of, (laughs) he's an old hippie who seemed to say a lot of good things. It's, I've got to say, though, I'm not real keen on his fan club. I, I forget which comedian, was it Patton Oswalt described it, Christianity is basically a book club. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, who, so. Oh, I'm trying to think, but who, who is the, oh, he's, his name's going out of my head. I'll think of it. The comedian who prays to, to Joe Pesci. He said, if you got a 50 50 shot of prayers, I'm going to pray to the God of Joe Pesci. Who is it? <laughs> It'll come to me. <laughs> so, so how does that work then? So, uh, so I suppose we're here, we're into we're into maybe some kind of Sam Harris territory where you can be spiritual, but, but without a, a faith. Is, is that I, right? I can totally disconnect. For some people, spirituality is religious. Um, but spirituality as a whole, to me, is things that are, are purposeful to you, what's meaningful to you. Everybody has their own sense of their belief system. You know, Einstein, not religious, incredibly spiritual and he could see and he's the one who said you know you can look at the world as everything is a miracle or nothing's a miracle and so he had a very deep spiritual sense very science-based not religious at all so for me and we've talked about this before it's not a big secret having grown up in a cult for like 18 and a half years where i this is what you believed and obviously not crazy about you know christian faith myself i'm not saying it's bad for everybody but the one i was in i would not recommend So when I left, I had, you know, there's a sense of, I don't believe any of this anymore. And when you don't believe anything, then there's like this sudden emptiness because you don't have any answers. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you want and what you want to do because you've been told for your whole life. So then I kind of went on my own little spiritual journey as many of the archetypes. If you ever follow um, Joseph Campbell's, he talks about the different archetypes and the hero's journey where they all, because the where they align with, say, the Jesus, uh, the Gandhis of the world, you go through Buddha, they all go through this whole journey to get to their current state of enlightenment or what they believe. So for me, not that I'm comparing myself to them by any means, but it was kind of studying every single religion and belief system, not super well, just to kind of get a sense of what people believed and starting to pick out, well, what do I believe? And at this point in my life, which it may change, but uh, there is not one thing that I can say, I'm that, that's what I am. You know, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Taoist. I'm, I, I like shamanism, but I wouldn't call myself a shaman. So I don't think I need to label it. And this is a very long answer. I apologize. But um, so you can be have a sense of what brings you meaning and purpose. You can have a sense of your own belief system, whether that be the laws of nature and physics or whether you believe there's a God or um, or that you co-create the universe and the universe is neutral. There's many different ways, but you have to find it for yourself. Yeah. So even though you're not religious, you can be deeply spiritual in what you believe and what has meaning for you. I think that a lot of religion takes actual fundamental truths about living a good life and being a, a, a centered, well-rounded person and then attaches religion to it. I can sit and watch on TV. We've got a channel, I forget what it is, and it's just all, you know, preachers and TV evangelists kind of thing. But I don't know if it's quite at the extent that you get them in Florida. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, and you watch it and you're like, the guy's making a lot of sense. And then all of a sudden he like staples a Bible verse onto this particular philosophy. And you think, no, that stands up without that. That stands yeah. up without a magical man in the sky. That stands up on its own as that's true about how living how you should live your life or you know be kind to world and all all the other things that that are actually within us most people are basically i believe that most people are basically good i believe that you know you could you could drive a, a ferrari in front of my local shops and leave the engine running with the keys in go in and buy something then get outside and the ferrari will still be there even though 14 people have walked past it with the keys in and the engine running they haven't got in and driven off in it because just people don't have that feeling of you know i'm going to steal or 
I remember Penn Gillette saying something about, you know, he was talking to someone who was very religious and, and, and he said to them, well, what stops you murdering and raping people if you don't have a faith? And he said something along the lines of, I have murdered and raped exactly the, the, right, the, say, the right number I want of people I wanted to murder and rape and that number is zero. <laughs> you know, it is funny how but, people seem to think that they need to have a higher yeah. power to lead them into the right way to live their life. I don't look at it, well, two things. I don't look at it necessarily as how to lead my life, right? So when I believe in a universe and I believe that there are entities out there that we don't know about, we can't see that are, are there. So I'll ask them for help and I'll believe there's some kind of connection. So to me, it's not dictating whether I'm a good person or a bad person. It's more how I collaborate to be the best possible person. Um, and to your point about a little, de little bit of a devil's advocate. Hey, um, feel free. Say, when you say, okay, they, they have a good statement and then they give a scripture. Well, some people need that reference. So for example, if I said to you, knowing that you don't believe in say psychic phenomena. I don't. And if I said to, right, I know that. So if I said something to you that was a psychic phenomenon, like, um, you know, I can mentally send a thought to you and you say, no, you can't. But I pull out a book you know, scientifically proving that energy waves and thoughts are energy waves and you really could and they have evidence and they do. I would have to research it where somebody can think something and it shows up on a printer what they've thought printing it up and they've done tests. Well, that gives it a little more validity because now there's, you know, years of scientific research proving it, you know, which may not change your mind by the look well, on your face. I, I, anyway, no, but. no. I actually, I actually like you. You know, I, like I'm, I'm an. I would describe myself as an atheist, as an, you know, atheist. Uh, I, you know, uh, of all the theism, I, I say no, I'm not having any of them. A little bit like you, you, you research them all, uh, and I actually hate it when something happens and I go, wow, that was pretty cosmic. That was, you know, and I'll give you an example of one of them, because I don't believe it. But you, if you did believe it, you'd make that fit. Right. And it was, you know, in February, I, I lost my job. I was running a radio station in London and I lost my job. And, you know, Julie and I went on a trip to visit her parents in New Zealand. Anyway, we get back to Britain and it's March and along comes lockdown and all of the radio stations and radio owners and groups, including the BBC, who I had meetings set up with to talk about where I go next in my radio career. All of those, everything got cancelled. It was at least six actual meetings I had, all of them got cancelled. So now I'm kind of up the creek without a paddle. I'm out of work. My severance <laughs> package is not going to last forever, although it was very generous. It's not going to last forever. And I need to work out how to make some money. And no one in radio is hiring right now because of this lockdown thing. So a friend of mine who's a builder, um, he said, I've got a friend who, who runs a company who they deliver pharmaceutical supplies and they're looking for van drivers. And I thought, well, if there's one business during a pandemic that's not going to get shut down, it is delivering pharmaceutical supplies to chemists and pharmacies. Right. He said, yeah, but you have to. So I went out and I, I rented a van for a month and they mm -hmm. were paying a, a flat cash fee for you to deliver it's all legit you know it's not yeah. nothing dodgy and the first day on this job and and remember you know i got into radio in 1993 and i used to say you know since that day i've not worked a day in my life because before that i was an air conditioning engineer i had a proper blue collar job and this was the first time i'd gone back to actually having a real job and earning an honest living <laughs> instead of you know being paid to tell fart jokes so <laughs> i i first day so i'm and a lot of it is lifting these boxes and containers of of these uh these drugs and, and delivering them not only did i lock myself in the back of the van at one stage but i got lost at another <laughs> stage you know but i got through the day it was a long day yeah. and i got home and i seen little black spots out of this eye and a little kind of a veil came over this eye so i said to julia I said well that's odd so I said, well, we'll, we'll that we have a thing in Britain called what with the National Health Service called uh, 111, which you dial for non-emergency things. And you can talk to someone about a symptom or something and they'll tell you what you should do next. So I dialed 111, long story short, ended up uh, going to hospital and they checked it out. 
and I had a horseshoe tear in my retina and my retina was actually starting to detach. And they did, when they saw me, they did laser surgery on, uh, on my eye, LASIK surgery on my eye, straight away. It was that urgent. Wow. And then, and, and, as, and the first thing they said to me was, no heavy lifting for you. So I had to ring this place and say, look, you know, I, I can't come in anymore. And over the period of the next three or four months, I had various surgeries on this eye, one particularly uh, gruesome one in an operating theater with, with whatever. And I have to go back about every, uh, I think in two weeks time, I go back for another one. I think the, the, the gaps between the, the visits to have it checked get longer and longer. But I can't do heavy lifting. So then I had to decide how to make a living without doing heavy lifting during a <laughs> pandemic, not doing radio. So I couldn't do any, anything physical, whatever. So that's when I, you know, I did some research and ended up working out how to record audio books. And I haven't looked back. It's been yeah. tremendous. I would never have been forced into that position if the job delivering stuff on a van had worked out. Because it was, it was a good job. And it was, you know, in a pandemic, it was pretty secure. Uh, so you'd have to go, after one day, you know, is that the universe saying to me, yeah. don't be doing this. There's something else you should really be doing that you'd be quite good at. And you'll meet amazing people like Danielle Pai on your yeah. journey. You know, because, yeah. no, the people you meet, you become more yeah. enriched by, you know, and I you know, mean that seriously that, you know, I've met some wonderful people doing this, which sounds mad. But like, if I was spiritual, I would go, well, that was clearly a message because it was a pretty brutal one. You know, it's like, it's not like, oh, maybe this is it's like, no, you can't do that. You better find something else. So yeah. I hate it when that happens. You hate it when that happens. Yeah, you know, because to... I'd like so, to believe. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking of all the ways life could have gone differently. Like you, you went, you were in New Zealand. You guys could have stayed there. Yeah. And wow. I, well, it, the funny thing is I had, I had meetings. I had three meetings set up with radio stations in New Zealand. And I had one meeting in Australia set up with yeah. a guy who was the head of a rate, the, the second biggest yeah. radio group in Australia. I had a meeting set up with him because I know him because I worked for him in England yeah. at one time. But those meetings got canceled. In fact, we weren't even allowed into Australia once the, the, the lockdown yeah. rules came in. Yeah, it all it all actually yeah. pushed me into this direction where I am now. Yeah, but in the parallel universe, you could be in New Zealand working yeah. in radio or doing audio books. And uh, the other thing, you know, uh, I find interesting is with the, you're kind of going backwards. You're going back to what you say, a proper job, doing something you didn't want to be doing like yeah. you had done before. Yeah. So it's, it's a step back. So yeah, so to me, I would say, okay, the universe and whatever that means, not not necessarily to you, but whether you believe in your ancestors looking after you, or you believe in gods or angels or whatever it is, there was something that was like, you've decided this is what you want for yourself. Now the universe, it's kind of one of my favorite lines from the book, The Alchemist. He said, when you know what you want, the universe conspires with you. And that's what I personally believe. Um, and to me that, yes, I would look at it as a good example. What I'm curious about for you is to me to think that there's nothing you just go through life and it's all your own doing it might go well it might not and then you die that would terrify me to not have an inkling that there might be somebody on your side like other than a living obviously you know your wife supports you you have friends that are supportive but doesn't that frighten you at all to like think it's all on your shoulders there's like nothing above to support no, i think because you know um i i always felt uh growing up rightly or wrongly that the 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 environment i was in with the family with my parents was not a good one and when i was you know i was living in my parents emigrated to new zealand when i was 18 when i was 21 they came back to the uk and left me there i always say i was i never left home i was abandoned on the other side of the world but i couldn't wait to get away from them and yeah. as soon as they went back i did all sorts of things that I'd always kind of wanted to do. And they didn't literally help me back, but it just it just felt like the environment was wrong. You know, that was when I learned to play the guitar. That was when I gave up smoking, which was a stupid thing to do in the first place. But um, I then, and I met Julie and, and I know if, if and you know, <laughs> Julie has said, you know, if I'd met your parents before we got married, because she met them, they flew out to New Zealand um, like the week before we got married, and that's when she met Julie. It was too late for her to back out then. She says, you know, if I'd <laughs> met your parents, like when we were just dating and that, you know, I would have had a whole different view of you. And I said, mm. <laughs> so 
I, I, I got to that point, and that's actually when I became an atheist, because up until that point, I did believe in, in the Christian God, at least. Not, I wasn't a fan. I, I mean, I wasn't fanatical. I wouldn't go to church or anything, but I believed yeah. it. But I suddenly thought, no, here I am on my own. I'm on the other side of the world. And all my friends who, who I'd worked on, I was a pipe fitter in oil refinery, all of my friends who, who worked at this oil refinery had all left the country and I, had either gone back to Britain or had either uh, moved on to Perth in Western Australia where they all went. And I was left in this little town in New Zealand. And I was on my own and I met Julie. And, and, but before I met Julie, but I was on my own and I kind of, that's when I became who I am. I became, it was once we met Julie and we moved to Australia together, we became who we are. But that was where I, it was, it was being in full, cause I'm driving now and I, I kind of like that. So I, I don't want to give anything to mm -hmm. some other higher power and, and have them be responsible. Yeah. I would yeah. rather be in charge. Now, if there is a higher power looking after me, great. Uh, and, yeah. and, and if I suddenly find some solid proof that that's going on, okay. But I don't, it's not, it's, so it doesn't actually frighten me. I actually want that. I, I, maybe yeah. I seek control. I don't yeah. know. No, no, and that makes sense, um, given what little I know your personality, because we've only talked this way. I don't know you in the, the rest of life, but you do seem very practical. Show me the evidence where I tend to be more of an abstract thinker, and I don't think I automatically believe something. But to your point of what you're saying, two things. Um, number one, I, I hear what you're saying about giving power away. I, I get really annoyed when somebody says, oh, it's in God's hands. I'll, they'll pray about it, but then they don't do anything. And I always feel like, okay, you, you've, got a, you've got a support team if you believe in that, but you have to ha take action. You, you decide what you want for you, and then the universe works with you. It's, it's not a, I'm giving my power away, you deal with it. So I, I guess I look at it more as a collaborative, but you have the final say. What I find interesting about what you're saying is, I would look at that as a deep spiritual evolution without religion, because here you are, you've decided what you want for yourself away from your family. So you set up an environment where you're doing things that are right for you. And then the universe sends you Julie, because would you say Julie is a supportive person who supports you in your endeavors? Absolutely. No question. You, you no question. Say, no question. I mean, one day, you know, I was working as an air conditioning uh, engineer in Sydney, Australia, and I came home from work one day and I said to her, I've worked out what I want to do for the rest of my life. And she says, what is it? And I went, I want to be on the radio. And she went, yeah, I get that. You should do that. If she'd have said, you know, oh, don't be so silly, wash your hands, your, your dinner's on the table, I wouldn't have done it. So yeah, supportive is, yeah. is absolutely right, yeah. definitely right about her. Yeah, yeah. And if you had been the kind of person who um, gave your power away, did whatever your family wanted you to do, you would not be where you are now, and you probably would not have met Julie. And if you had met Julie, you would not have been in the mindset to know she's the one yeah. I need. Oh, oh that's definitely, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. So so you think, you think my resistance to it being real is proof that it is? Uh, don't put <laughs> words in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I... I fully appreciate your it's it's all in the interpretation, yeah. which is which is a lot of what I've been studying as far as um, with the Myers-Briggs. I don't know if you're familiar with the Myers-Briggs personality types. There's, so the it came out of a psychologist, Carl Jung, in 1921. He published a book on um, different personality types. And he and he also ties into positive psychology, he wanted to look at healthy people, not people who had. A disorder. In fact, he was friends with Freud for a while, and they kind of had a falling out because Freud was big on telling you what's wrong with you. And Carl Jung was like, well, what's right with people? You know, what can they do well and how can they make their life better? So in people who are relatively normal, which, you know, I think most of us are, we don't, we may not always think we are, but we are. Um, there are 16 different personalities that largely people fall into, not 100% whether they're introverted or extroverted, whether they believe are likely to believe in a higher power, which I am, which you're not, which makes me think, gives me some clue about what your personality type might be. There are the people who fly by the seat of their pants through life. And then there's people like me who have a plan for the plan. When the first plan doesn't go right, here's another plan to put in place to make sure that everything goes okay. You know, um, and then there's the thinkers like my husband 
who's great and patient with processes and solving puzzles and problems. Whereas me, it's like, well, how do you feel about that? Tell me how you feel, not what you think, but how do you feel about that? So it kind of makes up. And again, that was long winded. So it's, it's just your perspective of the world. We could be seeing the same thing. This also gets back to Einstein. And I really don't know why I keep bringing up Einstein, but it's all in the observer, right? So. I, I would have thought though, with your journey, having some similarity to mine, mm -hmm. is that you grew up in an environment that you perhaps thought was, you were in a doomsday cult. And yeah. you, you know, you broke away from that. You went to New York City. You know, this was originally Pennsylvania. So you went to, you know, the, the big city from a rural community. And also you went from being within this cult to right. being, well now, now, crap, now all the, sense. all the boundaries <laughs> are now really flexible yeah. and you found your path. I would have thought you would more likely to be to go the same way as me because there are similarities there. Do, do you agree? Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, and there's a time where I kind of got rid of it all. And then I had to, you know, there's a tattoo that I uh, decided to get when I was in New York. I tried to take up drinking and smoking and I would stay out until 4 a.m. because I could not necessarily wanted to. And then, you know, bronchial pneumonia later, I realized that um, I don't have the system that can smoke. <laughs> <laughs> without without very dramatic like now if i walk past somebody who's smoking i actually break out in hives which yeah. was part of where lucine's patterns on her arms that's where the this idea is in the came data from. collector's book yes yeah yeah, yeah. So that's part of where that came is from it? so if I, yeah so scented candles certain things i can't tolerate and so yes i will literally you can see it on me before it it physically affects me anyway yeah. So, yeah, I, I did go through that. And I think it's just, you know, what you, again, how you perceive it, you know. And maybe I also got involved in, in martial arts and yoga. And even martial arts was tough for me because they would bow at the door. And to me, that's like bowing to a god. And you don't do that. That's part of the Ten Commandments. You don't worship anything other than the, you know. Oh, so you and still had a pretty strong Christian faith at this stage then? It's conditioning, you know, it's it's almost like you don't just get rid of it. So if you have conditioning that says anything that you, that goes well in your life is God working through you and anything you do bad, it's because you're an awful sinner and you deserve it. That doesn't, go, even though I can say that doesn't make sense, you're still going to have to undo the people pleasing you mentioned. If you do, if something goes wrong on a project, the first thought being, oh crap, what did I do wrong? It could have been anybody else on the team, but there's the immediate, I must have done something wrong. There's a slightly, or, there's a slightly healthy, though, a part of that, though, is to take responsibility that I think some people who have yeah. a higher power, they don't take responsibility for their own life. They go, well, it's what God wants yeah. or something. Well, it's like, no, hang on, you are, I, and I like to have the control. <laughs> I, yeah. I, and I think, you know, to your point about, you know, leaving the car running, people are mostly good. I believe that deeply spiritual people, whether, you know, because I don't want to discount religion because for peop some people that, that ties their family together, their traditions, and they have a really good life that maybe they wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, I think that most people find the healthy path in their belief system. The stuff we're seeing on the news now, I would say there's underlying other issues beyond religion. So Which stuff? there are certain personalities will gravitate toward that cult phenomenon and being told you're special and, and you don't have to think for yourself. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. I don't think that's the majority, though. I, I see. I, and and the one you were in, did it? I, I mean, now and again, there are celebrities that. Uh, yeah, no, it's not. The, it's not the one. you're. It's not Scientology, which is probably right. what you're thinking. Is I'm it the, chi the children or the family was another one that I think was no, it Joaquin um, Phoenix came so through? So mine, mine, and I'll, I'll say it, and people will be out there saying that's not a cult. So I grew up in the Worldwide Church of God. And if you look up Herbert W. Armstrong, you'll find it's a very interesting because I got obsessed a little bit with there's a documentary series on Scientology, and it's horrific. Like, I never went through, like, I watched that, and I'm like, wow, my life was a walk in the park. <laughs> but... I can see in the mindset and some of the things I was like, oh, yeah, Herbert W. Armstrong. Yeah, he stole that. Yeah, he did that. Like, so I feel like, and he also, you could start a cult, Graham, because I think he was a radio broadcaster first. 
Do you know, I think there was a radio... When I first went to New Zealand in the early 80s, in 83, yeah. a new FM station started, and it was a pop music station. But on a Sunday night, they had this... I think his name was Armstrong, you know. I can't remember. And he was he would do this fire and brimstone talk. He was yeah, obviously well, paying them a lot of money because they broke yeah. format to run it. <laughs> yeah, so it could have been him. So anyway, and he stole a lot from many different... And there's some religions that I consider a cult I won't name because... They don't consider themselves as such. Um, I think they yeah, all are. I think the Catholic Church is. So you could, you're not going to bother me. I was going to say there are people that I talk to that claim that any religion is a cult. And yeah. in fact, I did a, a podcast episode with Cindy, my publisher and friend, who, who you've met, and she was asking me questions. And and so and I just answered candidly, like, what do I think makes up a cult? And I've had people from whatever religion they came from, Catholic or otherwise, say, yeah, I think I grew up in a cult too. It just, you know. <laughs> So, you know, and I, and I don't I, I be, want to be careful not to to diss religion because it works for some people. Well, yeah. I, I don't I don't know why we're not why we are like if somebody believes something crazy, why do we give them the respect? I, I don't have any. I mean, mm. I give people respect and I yeah. believe people should have the right to believe whatever they want. But I, I don't think I need to respect their crazy thing that they believe. The closest thing I have to a religion that actually makes no sense but i will argue you know till the end of the day about it is you know i love liverpool football club and you know i believe that we are the best team mm -hmm. and i believe if we lose you know julie you know we'll watch the tv and i'll go that was never a foul and she'll go it was a foul it wasn't he never touched him i i <laughs> just i don't i think every decision that goes against us is wrong I think, you know, but I but I know it. I kind of know in the back of my mind it's silly, but I just really enjoy being such a one eyed fan. And and so if someone else is a fan of another team, I respect their belief that their team is the best. But I know they're wrong and I don't have any respect for. For their team. But but I do for their belief in it. And I don't see any difference between that level of respect. You know, I've got friends who are Evertonians. I've got friends who are Manchester United fans. And they're two of our biggest rivals. But it doesn't make me hate them because of that. I really like them. It's just I have a respect that, you know, because culturally they grew up in a slightly different environment. They ended up going that way, exactly the same way. You know, if we were having if we were both from Israel and we're talking, we, we'd both probably be Jewish or at least culturally Jewish uh, and it just, it's because that's how you get religion you, usually it's because you ended up in a doomsday cult not through it you didn't seek it out you right. you you were there because it, it's a cultural thing so I don't think and, and like no one would give would, would go like if I said you know I'll Liverpool are the best no one would say oh, I'm not going to challenge you because I, I I need to respect your faith they would just go, okay, fine. You know what I mean? And I think I don't think there's really much. I don't know why religion is put such on such a a high level of respect, and you're not supposed to question, you know, some of the ridiculous things in, in mostly the virgin birth and you know all the rest of it. You know, I don't know yeah. why you can't just go. Well, it's pretty silly, you know, not eating pork or whatever the thing was, a circumcision or any of the any of the b beliefs, because you can get into this what I call the tolerance paradox, mm -hmm. where there are certain Eastern religions, and maybe there's one, we dare not speak its name because this is on the internet and they've been known for not appreciating criticism, but we get into a tolerance par paradox where we tolerate people's religious beliefs, but their religious beliefs are actually anti-women, anti-gay, and, anti you know, a lot of things, which... There's that that's a lack of intolerance by giving the tolerance to their belief instead of saying, no, you really should throw gay people off buildings for being gay. You really shouldn't stone adulterers. That's wrong. But we kind of give them a pass and the way they treat women. Um, and and we, I don't think you should give them a pass. There's right and there's, there's things that are right and things that are wrong. And I don't think you should give people a pass because you have this respect for, yeah. for their religious belief, which is crazy. Yeah. And anyway. <laughs> no, but so I feel like you're putting it into one big category. Okay. It is or it isn't. Yeah, that's me. So I, I like to simplify. That. Yes. <laughs> so 
I would to that, I would say, number one, you should be able to question. The minute you can't question something like virgin birth, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. And then if you have uh, some one say, well, it's a metaphor. It's not a real thing. It's a metaphor because of whatever. It's like, OK, I can get that it's a metaphor and not the real thing that I can live with that. I can live with that, too, you because, you know, about... a lot of the a lot of the Bible stories and that they're uh, they're like Aesop's fables, you know, fine. Yeah. Can, if I'm someone wants to, you know, not eat for a day because they believe in their faith calls it and you say, well, OK, you know, people go through cleanses all the time for health reasons. And I it can does no one that. else any harm. Right. Exactly. And so that and to me, that's the criteria. You know, you can believe whatever you want and I'll respect you. The where the respect goes away is to your point when it's against women, when it's um, telling women should do this and can't do and, and men to do that. And there's no crossing the lines. You can't be gay. You you know, any of those restrictions. Yes, I would absolutely lose respect. So I'm not disrespect. So I respect people's beliefs. But yes, I have my own caveats. I just wouldn't put it in a group of all people who believe in religion are this and all people that don't are that. There's so much. There's a lot of gray area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK. All right. So can we talk about Birdland Media Works? What do, what's that is? Sure. What does that encompass for you? What, what What's that part of okay. your life? Yeah. So it's changed a lot in the last. So so it started in 2006. And uh, and I started off basically as a freelance writer. I was hired, uh, say, as a food writer. I knew nothing about food. I just was a really good writer and they needed somebody to do it, which is and it worked out well because I ended up learning how to cook because I'm like, I can't be going into these restaurants. And, you know, and really it wasn't critiquing the food as much as the environment and writing about it and, and whether people could see themselves there. But I wanted to add some legitimacy. So I had to learn how to cook so that I had a clue what I was talking about. So food writing, I did some event writing. Um, I would do press releases. And, and, and basic, long story short, it was like whatever somebody needed. They need a web page, I'd do it. They need blogs, I would do it. Um, and actually, I worked for a New Age magazine, so I ended up the people that that you would think are woo woo. I interviewed a lot of them, and and it was interesting. You know, I I I tend to have a healthy skepticism. I don't automatically believe or disbelieve. I kind of look at it as maybe, you know, and we'll see. So um, it wasn't probably within the last I don't know how long have I been doing this now? Two thousand six, long time. So past five or six years, it kind of evolved. So it became, I went from writing out there as a journalist, um, and, and I was very popular on Facebook and social media because everybody thought, oh, she's a journalist. She could write about me and promote me. So then I switched to uh, businesses, working for businesses. So I would do their press releases and their web content behind the scenes. So my name was not on a lot of things. And suddenly I wasn't very popular anymore. Like hundreds of people just unfollowed me on Facebook. Like, well, she's not going to help me with my career. So why bother? Yeah. <laughs> you learn who your friends are when you're no longer popular. And I was never like famous or anything, but, but I had a little bit of a following. So I ended up uh, for different, and, and I would juggle sometimes 12 or more contracts where for some person it might be managing their social media accounts. Somebody else, it might be, you know, a little bit of videography for an educational video. Um, the audio was in within the last few years, they might need a voiceover, like they have a video, but they need like a script over top of it. So it was these little projects that kind of all gelled together into a full-time job. Um, at the time, I was also, you know, teaching yoga. So, but that was more kind of an, an additional thing. Within the last couple of years is when, and you you met Dr. Roger because we did the the podcast, Doc Roger and Friends. But through his company, they got so busy, and their stuff was really interesting to me because I got to lead meditation classes. I got to develop programming that they would, you know, like written content where this is how you do this program on spirituality or on social connection or something that educates people. So there were videos and recordings and things in there. So as they grew, I was kind of like getting rid of like the other stuff. So basically the, the people that were difficult to work with or the work you were doing because you needed the money versus you didn't necessarily want to be doing it started to, you know, and, and for me, some people don't care. It's like if it if if it brings in money as long as I mean they were ethical things it wasn't anything like that was wrong with them but if I have a choice between promoting a restaurant that I happen to like 
or something that could make life better for people and make them happier, that's where I'm going to go. You know, my, my energy is going to be in things that are going to make life better. So anyway, so that's where Birdland is as of today. Um, so I, I, my primary focus is, is programming for them. And then as little projects come in, I, I actually had a referral um, for a teacher and I and she does a lot of STEM training. She she's a former teacher who provides resources to teacher for like STEM training. And I find that it cool because she's a woman and a lot of women are have been dissuaded from science and technology. I think the work she's doing is cool. So I'm like, all right, we'll get on a conversation and see if there's something that makes sense, you know. And I, I don't know if I can help her or not, but I, and also a STEM researcher, and she thinks that that um, more attention should be placed on writing. And I was like. A science geek who writes, I definitely am going to take <laughs> have this conversation and see. So, wow, that was long with. <laughs> you also do, you know, you do like social media for people. You did, you you were a social media manager for a sex therapist. Again, I should not be writing email when I'm sleep deprived, but I, it's an interesting story. Yeah, so. I, again, I appreciate the work that she was doing because she was providing a lot of information to women in developing countries who did not have access to this information, that you should, and it's really sad. But she also had a practice in this country and, you know, would talk to, to you know, kind of people would come in with their relationship issues. So my job uh, was to not only post her, you know, video and blogs that she had written and, and promote her book because she had written a book, but also find articles related to what she was doing to put on social media. The problem is, as you might have determined from reading my books, I love, I'm a hopeless romantic. I love romance, but it's like a kiss and fade to black. <laughs> You don't need to know what happens after. You, yeah. you know Some waves happens. crashing, some curtains exactly. in the breeze. It's exactly. all you need. We and know. I'm one, if I'm watching like a romance, I like the romance, but if I'm watching some of these movies, I'm like, I feel like I'm intruding. <laughs> so there's me, the, the Disney character, as I've been described. And I'm reading these instant messages, and you know there's a problem when it opens with something like, is this weird? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they go into detail about some medical thing, and then they're like, and I can send pictures. I'm like, no, <laughs> do not send pictures. And of course, the response, you, you can't give medical advice on social media. So, you know, of course, I'd go back to the doctor and she would have like an appropriate response. But some of it is just like, you can't, un I wish I didn't know. You know, you'd, <laughs> you'd read this article. I'm like, no, really? No, that can't be true. It's and then funny. you'd Google, it's like, really? <laughs> And then you'd have the occasional, um, there was one man, I, I swear he was cheating on his wife. And he was always posting about all the great sex he and his mistress were having. So whenever there was an article about, you know, things to do in the bedroom, he was the first one to chime in. Now me, as me, wants to write, you let, you should apologize to your wife and hope she takes you back. Whereas, you know, the sex therapist is like going to be very neutral and not going to be as judgy as I am. So, yeah. It's, it's it was funny. it was interesting. When while I lived in Australia, the uh, the number one uh, hit music station in Sydney was called Today FM, and they had a phone in in the evening, hosted by a doctor, and she was called Doctor Feelgood, and it was where people called in, you know, with you know things like that, and and yeah, it got freaky, you know, to the to yeah. the level of like gerbils. Uh, anyway. Uh, that actually was a call. <laughs> anyway, um, she was interviewed by Doug Mulray, who was another radio presenter who I really liked there when he had a TV show. And he, and he asked, what's the most popular question that people ask Dr. Feelgood? And she said, am I normal? <laughs> <laughs> that was the number one question. So it's funny. Which is funny because I think that's the number one question that people ask themselves in life in general. <laughs> Who am I? What do I want in this world? And am I normal for wanting what I want in this world? Right? You know, and to that, I think most of us are by and large are normal. Uh, and we're just human, which means we're imperfect by nature. So we're perfectly imperfect, but we're normal. And again, my opinion. Let's so. get to the data collectors then. So as I said, I've been honored to be chosen as the narrator for the first two books. They're a science fiction book. But they do deal with a lot more than just 
geeky science fiction y things. So tell us the background behind you going, I'm going to write a book about some people from another planet who come and collect information on people from Earth and then, then some of the characters like Lucene and Tanager yeah. and that. Just just tell I always, us to it. Yeah, and we talked a little bit about this before without the, being too repetitive where, you know, uh, part of it was a cat and part of it was meeting these people. You know, I'd meet people who just, when we're talking about normal, who don't seem normal. They just kind of have this deer in headlights when you're talking to them. And I had this image of like, Maybe that person is just, it's a cam, their eyes are cameras and they're just like collecting information and sending it back. And I have a cat who, who I said did the same thing. She would just look at you, Row. like, r explain what this is about, Row. like, so that I can translate it. So, it, it, you know, so part of it was just thinking, you know, what if, first of all, I think it's a danger <laughs> that we broadcast and seek out life. I don't know what you're, your feelings are on aliens and, uh, you know, I think it would be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Arrogant to think we're the only things in the yeah, entire I, I, universe. I believe that too. If, if now, the, especially if the universe is as big as they say and as diverse as they say, there must, it, it, life must have happened somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. Life's happened, and whether there's other humans or variations of humans, I think there's a good probability. Just like I think there's parallel dimensions, I think there's other, like, worlds out there and other universes. Um, I, I, worry about the fact that we go looking for it because you know and this is just i have nothing to back it up but i'm like you know look about look at the wars we have in this world you know we we can't even keep the peace in our own country why are we trying to talk to other planets we don't know what they're like we don't know what their technology is there's probably a bad idea so that is kind of what stimulated the idea of well what if there's the good planet that's that's trying to help us, the indifferent planet that's like, okay, when Earthlings are dead, we'll just come and take over. And the bad planet who's like, well, we've we've destroyed ours, so let's go take theirs. And and of course it deals with I know I'll get a lot of grief because it deals with climate change and, yeah. and some of the things that we're um you know, managing here. I tried I wasn't trying to be political and I wasn't trying to make these heavy handed statements. What was odd is, you know, this book now, the idea was like over six years old, six, seven years old. Are you talking I, about yeah. book two or book three? So okay, sorry, book one right. first. Okay. I'll, I'll book take one. That up. Yeah. Um this was years before the stuff that we're seeing now, and I'm not a prophet or anything. It just happens that now that the books are out, they sort of line up with a lot of the stuff that's happening. Um, you mean pandemic? The, well, the pandemic was added. No, okay. I mean the pandemic. I had a reference to it, but it wasn't. Um, yeah, that was kind of added after the fact. For so, book so two what stuff? What, what what stuff then? What? Well, um, so environmental, uh, some political. You know, because I, I and I I've never been heavy heavily political until 2016, and a lot of the stuff that was, has been happening in in this country, but. I really think that you can make any connection that you want. So people could look at the Royals and the Vitruvians and the Erdlings and the Earthlings, and they can say, oh, well, that's this group. Well, that's this group. And oh, she's referring to this president. I didn't have that intention at all. You didn't, because I, 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 I saw that in there. I didn't. And wow. I know people will make those connections and they'll think I'm a lot smarter than I really am. Um, no, when you're it was smart. A creative, it was just a creative thing. Um, I did pull in some of uh, some of the pandemic because it actually helped the plot along in a couple of places. Uh, but yes. So did I answer your question? I think no, I think you did. <laughs> so then you decide you're going to sit down and write it, which must take tremendous yeah. discipline and time management yeah. and all the other things and with it, you being so crazy yeah. busy how did you carve out time where you can just yeah. focus with with so much all going on just yeah. on this amazing story and, and and bringing it all out i think that's why i'm in a rush so the first book you know took like five and a half years and part of what was tangling me is I read books on how you're, like I wrote, you know, I was a journalist. You sit down, you write 1,200 words or 2,000 words, you're done, one sitting. You know, you edit and it's gone. The book, I thought, was just like a recipe. You just 
multiply it. You sit, you write, next day you sit and write, and then I realized, no, you don't. So when I'm trying to outline, I couldn't figure out all the plot points. I couldn't figure out all the scenes and the characters just so, and I tried to follow the rules. And I and I mentioned this when we spoke before. You know, I'm sitting in meditation like, I this book has to get done. It's taking too long. And then, you know, it hit me, just write whatever you think when you sit down. Whatever scene is moving you to write, just write it. So I wrote all three books are written out of order. And with the first book, there was a lot of, I had to fix like continuity errors and things that was a headache um, because I didn't, do, I hadn't done it before. By book two, I was so much in the flow. I had the characters, I had the setup and and I let, gave, gave the characters, it sounds crazy, liberty to, to be whoever they were. So who I thought they were, they, um, for example, Roman's character, I did not plan what he ended up, what ended up happening with him. I did not plan from the start. Wow. I had him, I don't want to give anything away, going in a completely different direction with who he was and what he was about. And as I was writing the story, I'm like, oh, that's not, that's not who he is at all. And a lot of the characters were like that. You know, there were, there were not necessarily all good or all bad. You know, there was a lot of nuances where they're mostly good, but when they need something here or when it makes sense for the greater good, they maybe do a couple of bad things. So, and did that uh, come from just getting to know the characters better? Yeah, it, getting to know them. And then when you get, you know, you're writing and, and like I said, I'm writing in different order and there's like a gap and I'll say, well, what's what's going on there? Like, how, how does this fit? And then I go for my bike ride. Six, six miles riding my little cruiser riding around and it's like ah I got it <laughs> and then I go back and you know but yes um, I do have a ridiculously strict schedule for myself as far as you know work for Birdland contract work that I'm doing um, work to set up the coaching business which um, you know that that's been in the last year and then setting aside time to write outside of the pandemic even if there weren't a pandemic uh, people would not see me very often because I work a lot of crazy, you know, I take breaks. I'm, you know, I don't, it's not like I don't take a break, but we're nights and weekends, I'll be working on this stuff. And, and that's where, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, I said, okay, I've done it for a year. I do need to slow down and prioritize and say, okay, this piece has got to go away and this has got to go away. But yes. And the characters who are fabulous, because as a narrator, I, I love, you know, if, if characters are a bit bland or something, it's very hard for me to, to find, to give them a voice because I'm only yeah. guessing whether it's the 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 kind of, you know, I, all I've got is the words on the page. So the better the yeah. writer the, and the better the characters and the deeper they are, the easier it is for me and the more fun it is for me. And yours yeah. are fabulous. I mean, Lucene is definitely you. We mentioned Ivan earlier, which is, which is John. Uh, however... But you, you know, said, but Lucine is not exactly me because you said yes. last time you think she's crazy. Now, unless okay. you think I'm, do you no, think I I'm don't, crazy? No, I don't. I don't mean, I, I mean crazy in the <laughs> nicest I, way, in an that. endearing I, way. But yes, I know, I know. Yeah, but she isn't, no, she isn't you. There is just yeah. a large part, a piece of your your personality, which you, you've given her the same thing. She is who she yeah. is, but there is, yeah. a, there is a piece of your personality that is within her. I yeah. I get the feeling she is more, um, I want to say independent, but that's the wrong word. I, she's more feisty, I think, and wants her own way more. Than, I think you're a bit more easygoing than she is. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, I, I see. You know, having you know, we we don't we don't know each other that well, and we've only ever spoken this way. But as I have more to do with you, and and more to do with yeah. your with narrating your books is I see other parts of you in some of the other characters. Like, I see little bits of you in Tanager, I think. Yeah. And Tanager and Fatima, for sure, yes. and Isabella, yeah. 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 And, and Tanager... also, Jeff, by the way, I have to tell you, and, and I, I know I mentioned this before when you said about the characters, she was the one that, that kind of came into my head, like... Who, Fatima? When she said the characters, uh, Odessa. Odessa, she okay, said, yeah. She goes, you know, where she says to Tanager one scene because he's so polite you're so boring like you're so <laughs> like you're so boring you do everything the right way because he does he does everything the right way he's very you know he's lovely. and 
I kind of took her advice and I'm like, yeah, my characters are too normal. They're people that I'd like to hang out with. I need to mess them up a little bit. <laughs> so book two with Lucene is like, okay, you know, and I can draw from my own life experience. You, you know, the childhood could have gone better. Um, what if following that line of people who do grow up in cults and their life doesn't go well? Right. You know, they get into some pretty bad stuff. It's like, well, what if she went down a different road? How bad would it be? What would happen to her? And that's kind of how she developed a lot of that, you know, the, the, the things that she goes through in the second book. And so I kind of, yeah, I had to figure out, all right, in what way are they damaged and how can, how can I exploit that to make an entertaining book? <laughs> no, I think you did with her because, you know, I got I got to know her and I really like, because I ended up rooting for characters in the book. I mean... I enjoy yeah. doing Jasper, but I don't like him. But I enjoy it because yeah. I don't like him. However, Lucene I like and I kind of care for. And she gets in the second book, she gets into a relationship with someone who I know yeah. is bad for her. And I'm yeah. just wanting her to ditch the bomb. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. is, is, is that, was and that written in there to make people feel that way? I was hoping. And I was trying not to. And that was intentional. Um, I was, you know, you, you think about the nuances of relationships and when you read or you see something on TV uh, that's a fictional account of the good guy versus the bad guy, the bad guy is always completely obvious. Mm. Smacks someone around, says nasty things, like does all these awful, like, you know, he's the bad guy. And I'm like, you know, but in life, the bad guy sometimes really comes across as the good guy. Mm. And he's might be the good guy in work, but maybe in personal situations, he's a real jerk. So I was trying to make him and hopefully that it got across that this is a weird manipulation and it's dysfunctional, but it doesn't on the surface appear that way to most people. And it certainly didn't oh. appear that way to her. And I always wanted to tell her <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. this guy. Um, so they really are. The characters in it are very, very real, even though. Most of them are aliens. Yeah. But, uh, oh, it's, no, it's, uh, it really is good. And on this one, we produced it in a totally different way. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that and how that, and how that experience was for you? Yeah. So, and I'm looking forward and, and I know it's, it can be an editing nightmare putting the voices together. And, That's and I my think issue. That's not yours. But the, I the do, finished I, result is it worked much better. Yeah, I think so. I, I definitely think so. Um, it would be interesting if it weren't a pandemic and we were sitting side by side. I'd be curious to know how the, the but characters... For those who be, don't know what we're talking right? about, in the first book, I narrated the whole thing and so did all the characters. But in the second book, well, you suggested it, and I went, yeah, great idea, um, is all of the female characters yeah. are narrated by Danielle Pai. Yeah. Actually, so, you suggested it. I just did jumped I? on You did. In the first interview, you said, uh, Cindy had said that, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's okay. She, she was talking about, like, why would I hire somebody to do the audio book because I do voiceover work and she really likes my, because I do a lot of guided meditation. She's like, you have such a nice voice. And at the time, with all the other stuff I was doing, I didn't have time. And and I really liked your voice, your audition. And, and so um, you had said at that moment, he's like, well, why don't you write a book where you can do some of the characters and, and okay. I'll do the male voice and you do the female. The problem is you said that as like a throwaway comment and I just latched onto it. I was like, yes, let's do that. <laughs> and you were and nice enough to do it. So the, the thing that was interesting is the fact that you're recording your sections in the UK and I'm recording it in America. We're not in the same room like we're doing a cartoon, which makes it so I'd have to kind of hear what you're saying in my head and then how I would respond. And so I, I think it, it came out really good. The thing that I learned is the characters in my head were very diverse, but when they came out of my mouth, all from me, they all sounded like me. And it was no, that same. No, no, Lucene that did, but no, first. Odessa didn't. And Oh, that was, that was the final product. But when I first started oh, reading it, okay. it was kind of like the character development. They're too boring. I'm like, oh, there's not enough diversity. So I actually went online and started, first I started playing. I went for a long walk and I'm like, well, how can I make my voice sound different? So I'm like dropping in my throat, 
kind of talking nasally. I'm practicing how I pronounce things and, and the pitch and, and the pacing and things. And I'm like, well, what else could I do? So I, you know, got back home and I looked online and I started researching. And if I heard an accent that I liked and I was like, that sounds kind of like Isabella. Now, I never wanted, because I'm not an expert at accents by any means, so I never wanted to claim, and it's and it's not on earth, so who cares? Um, I never wanted to claim, okay, this is German, this is you know Caribbean, this is French. I just wanted them to sound unique so that when you heard the book, you knew who was talking. And so I would have to practice one for about 10 minutes, and then I'd go read the part. Had we had all the time in the world. I probably would have done one character at a time and gone through the entire book as just that character and then gone on to that because you get on a roll. Yeah. And then when you get the characters that have like there's one one scene where there's three women talking to each other. I'm like, oh, my God, why did I write it this way? <laughs> so, yes. Well, you enjoyed the, the, the process of finding the voices was, for the characters because these fun. You, you, I it was weird. You know, when I get to, to some characters like uh, Hai Sakia, who's kind of a throwaway character in, in book two, and she shows up again in book three, where I found myself like moving a certain way yeah. as I'm doing her voice. And I'm like, that was weird. Or, you know, some of them, I, I just, I or I'd find myself changing my facial expression like uh, uh, Sabrina, I'd have to, this, I'd, I'd have to keep my teeth together for, to get that disdain. Uh, Fatima was supposed to have a very lovely voice in my head and she came out Brooklyn <laughs> and I'm like okay so but you always know when she's talking <laughs> yeah and that's all the listener needs is to know who's talking but yeah. it, it adds to it when you can bring more to it and you did when I first started hearing them I was like oh wow this is really cool this is really I, good. Know, and it helped would, me too because a lot of them, the the characters would have a conversation with the character I was doing. So it was yeah. much easier to listen to what the character was saying for me to then respond as my character. Now, you didn't have that because you yeah. recorded them all cold. Yeah. I had the easy part because I had them to react to. Yeah, well... And, and that's funny that you say that. You know, no, two things to that point. Num number one... Like you're, you've traveled a lot more in the, and seen more of the world than I have just in past conversations where you've lived. So I don't have those accents to draw on other than maybe I know a couple people with accents, but I'd have to go online and research. So I was fully expecting you to come back and say, yeah, that's crap. <laughs> like, no, you know, no. That's not going to work. And it would have been okay if you did. Like I would take that constructive feedback. They were like aliens, that. Daniel. How do I know what they sound like on another planet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I want my big thing was not to offend somebody to think, oh, there, she's trying to do this, and it sounds nothing like what I sound like. So I was trying to be careful not to to overdo them, and I and I hope that I succeeded. You um, definitely I, did. You definitely did, and it brings a oh, richness that yeah. I don't have in any other audio book I've done, where you know the, the all the female characters are done by somebody else. It comes across and I, wonderful. I think it could. I think it's a good thing. It could be a good thing. I, I think more people should do like what's called the multicast. There's not that many. There are other out there, but you, most of the time they're a very high end production where they have an entire cast, like you do a cartoon or a movie. So this is like a multicast, and you know, on a Danielle budget. <laughs> but but um, what I found interesting as I'm writing the third book now that I I've listened to the final audio is I can hear your voice as the characters as I'm writing, and I'm hearing the characters as I'm writing back, and then I'm like, okay, that's going to sound weird. Like, in the written word, it's okay, but it's not going to translate to audio, and that is something that I didn't even think about. When I was writing the books, it was just to tell the story. I see. Now, I tell the story, but that's not going to translate in an audio environment. So I need to change a few words. And will you do like a different version for the print version to the audio version? Or you'll, you'll do just the one version? But do you, you do don't think that holds version. you back as, as, as a creative writer that you have to make them fit for, to be spoken? No, um, it's actually an interesting challenge. Because to me, you know, I, I like to write concise, not nearly like when I talk, I babble all over the place. But when I write, I like it to be concise. So to me, it's 
brevity. So you write it and then you reconstruct it in, to be as efficient as possible to, to get the message and still be entertaining. So I don't find that restrictive because I'm going to write to write and then in the editing process think, okay, that in a way it helps me because the, I'll say, you know, a character, the character wouldn't say that or they wouldn't sound like that or I'm giving them lines to say that that are out of line with their character. So in a way, it kind of helps me like fine tune a little bit. Mm. I know exactly what you're saying because most of the writing I've ever done has been writing for radio. And yeah. you're writing for broadcast, as you probably know, is very different to writing for when it can be read because broadcast is usually a linear experience. You can't go back and reread. So it has yeah. to be very short sentences and uh, no long words or very short words. So instead of saying it was adjacent to, you have to say it was next to and you know things like yeah. that because people have to get it first time. Yeah, so I see. So you're starting, oh, to, starting to get to... Interesting. Yeah. Now they, now they would have to be rewritten because I'm already thinking about it. And, and I know it's a pie-in-the-sky thing. I have no idea how to make it happen. Um, but, you know, most people write a book and they're like, oh, I want to hit the bestseller list. I, when I was writing, I would take a line from one of the characters and I'd post it on social media with a quote with who the character was and a link to the book. And I could actually see a cartoon image in my head of what that character would look like as a comic book character. And so I was thinking, what would it be? You know, would I hire somebody to rewrite the story for a comic book? Would I rewrite it myself and hire an artist? What would that look like? And I don't have the budget for that. So maybe somebody else like a Marvel could pick it up, and they, could, which I know all pie in the sky, and they wow. could rewrite it. But yeah. then you think for a cartoon, say like an anime. So, so I'm not a particular fan of. Uh, I I like my Disney cartoons. John really likes anime, and what I find interesting about the art form, if you've ever watched their storylines, they're they're stories for kids and young adults, but very heavy themes and very educational and quite different from what you what a, a normal cartoon that I would see in America, like some hard hard themes. And I was like, this could work really well as an anime series. And, and how would the dialogue be rewritten? Because you're not going to have those descriptions. You have those descriptions you have to see on the screen. Yeah. So, so is that yeah. what could be next then for the data collectors? Uh -huh. Obviously, there's a third book due. Yeah. Uh, the the yeah. current book, by the way, uh, which is called Breach of Contract, is out now. And all the details on how to get it are in the blurb below this, if you're watching Thank on you. YouTube. All the details <laughs> there. Click on there. Uh, sign up to Audible for free. Get a free trial. You can download it for free. And uh, there's a sample there. You can click and you, you can hear us going at it and you hear what the, the two of us and sound like together. And it, leave a re please leave a review because yeah. you know, even the, that's what gets you up the... the uh, search engine chart that kind of cuts through the masses but um oh yeah sorry yeah so, so yeah so book two <laughs> is out book three yeah. is coming out soon what and I'd then like to... what's next for daniel pay okay so with the books as far as the the marketing i want to i know some sources that i want to look into how to pitch it for i not necessarily you know a movie which would be great but maybe start with uh, something a little more attainable, like a streaming service, um, you know, something that that is achievable and kind of work your way up. I don't know. Again, I don't know how to make that happen. I can pitch it and and wait and see. I certainly am not like independently wealthy where I can just I'll just do it myself. <laughs> like with books, it's a little different when it's like a movie production. But um, I I'm not in a hurry. If it happens in the next ten years, that would be nice. But it's not like I'm going to give up on those those characters. Uh, as far as what's next, I have several different, and one's another trilogy. They start off as a as a short story, and I realize no, this is a book. And then as I'm writing the book, I'm like, no, it's another trilogy. <laughs> um, so there, and what I'm considering, there's there's actually a few different ones. One is more of a young adult, which I'm not sure about yet. Because I, I haven't been a teenager in a very long time and I don't have kids, but it's kind of floating through my brain. Another would be more of a mystery series. And then the one that makes the most sense, there was actually a, a trilogy that I was going to write when I started the data collectors. because, And I chose this one because, uh, as I mentioned, I had weird dreams and the characters kept nagging me. So that was the one I did first. I'm wondering now that I've created this data collection world and these characters are so great if I can write that one in 
with new characters and a new storyline, but who's to say it can't be in like that world. So if you've ever read, um, and I'm not comparing myself to Terry Pratchett, but if you've ever read like the Discworld series, he'll have this whole storyline. And then in the same world, there's like dozens of other books and characters that are all parts of this bigger world. And he just kind of keeps building it, or he's not alive anymore, but he would keep building it out. So, so characters' yeah. backstories might come into it because you you're not limited exactly. to the time frame either, which that would exactly. be fascinating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and then you can have the Lucines and the Tanagers and the Fatimas kind of show up in these other books. And the way Pratchett does it, and he 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 was just a master at it. Like you didn't have to have read the twenty something other books to get to that point in the in the timeline. He could throw off, mention some character offhanded and you just accepted it. It was part of the story. And you don't find out till you read some of the other books. It's like, oh, that character has a really interesting backstory. So, yeah. Well, looking forward to all that. I don't know how you're going to fit it all in. I don't know how you have the time. I don't know how you do it. I've taken <laughs> up Wait, Jeez, we've been going nearly an hour and a half. Yeah, but you're fun to talk to. <laughs> well, I well, I'm glad about it because I'm aware it's, I've been stealing. I've been a time bandit. Yeah, and your schedule is crazy too. So the fact that you made time to do this with all the other stuff, I, I really appreciate it. Oh no, my pleasure, Danielle. It's always great to talk to you. You're a fascinating person. You've created fascinating characters in an amazing two books, soon to be three books. They're called The Data Collectors. Links to everything are in the blurb there. Download them now, be part of this. Once you're hooked in and you get into this, you're gonna love it. So uh, hey, thanks a lot and continued success. Thank you. Thanks for having me.